This is our third and last week. We've been talking about marriage and and uh, part of county wide emphasis. They the rest of them are starting this week and we're finishing, so we're two weeks ahead of them all. Um, and we're going to talk about little ones, about the kids. Okay. Let's begin in prayer. Now, Lord Jesus, open our hearts to you. That we may grow in you and we may serve you, Lord. That we may be the kind of parents and grandparents that you call us to be. To put your word first in our lives and in our children's lives. In Christ's name, amen. Well, how important are our children and our grandchildren to God. Now, if you paid attention to the gospel lady reading as we read, you get a glimpse of just how important kids are to to God. Because in this passage, Jesus tells us that if we cause a child to sin, it would be better off if we had a millstone tied around our necks and tossed in the sea. Now, think about that. That's better off than what God wants to do to you. You'd be better off cutting your hand, or gouging out your eye. Better off. The little children are protected by angels who always have the Father's ear. The Father himself is watching over them. In in this context of children that Jesus talks about leaving the 99 to find the one. And that God the Father wants none, none, of these little ones to perish. So what is God saying for us today? He's saying, woe. He's saying, woe to you child abusers who enjoy hurting or abusing children. Woe to those who find sexual pleasure in children. But maybe more closely to home, woe to you who teach by word or example that sport, school, fun, or future is more important than God. Woe to you parents and grandparents who do not teach your children the word of God. Woe to you who do not strive daily to make sure your children enter the kingdom of heaven. D.F.W. Walter, who was the first president of our synod, wrote this in a sermon. This is back in the 1840s. He's talking about parents and children. They, children, have not been given to us for playing and joking, much less that they only be our servants. Rather, they, children, have been entrusted to us by God that we should direct them to their heavenly Father already when they do yet know nothing about him. So in other words, from day one. One day God will demand at our hands the souls and the bloods of our children and say to us, where are they, the children that I gave you? The prophet Malachi talks about this too. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hands. In other words, God's not talking back. He's not answering you. He's not blessing you. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her says to the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in spirit and do not be faithless. Now notice what God says. This is a heavy passage. Notice what God's saying in this passage. God will not accept your offering or anything you do for him if your marriage isn't right. In your marriage, God literally made you one with another person. And not only that, God was a witness to your marriage. And it was he who gave to your marriage a portion of his spirit. 
God literally made a portion of himself into your marriage. And God had a purpose for your marriage because the purpose for marriage is to produce godly offspring. Notice it's not to have kids. It's to produce godly offspring. Godly children. For the one who divorces their spouse commits injustice and covers his garment with violence. Now, that passage tears me up. Okay? I'm divorced. And I know many of you are. And that's, that's a tough, tough passage. But I have to live with, and you have to live with, that in every divorce there's sin. No matter what the cause of divorce, there's sin. Divorce is sin. Am I forgiven? Yes. Have I been redeemed by the blood of the Christ? Have you been redeemed by the blood of Christ? Yes. Has God restored us? Yes. In my case, I know God has given me a new wife and who's a blessing to me and a blessing to my ministry. So God has done wonderful things to that. I don't need to live in guilt because I'm divorced. I don't need to live in what ifs. I do not need to live in fear of God will not accept me or love me or protect me or take me home. But all of that does not deny the sin of divorce. I can't deny it. Nor does it remove the scars upon my children. Because the reality is, every, ch every divorce brings scars upon our children. It does not stop me from questioning, what would my children be today? If I had lived a godly life and my spouse and I both had committed our walks to God the way it should have been, would my son be an evangelist or a pastor or leading people to the Lord? Would my daughters be missionaries or deaconesses or very strong men of God who would lead them in God's word? Instead, what I see in my family is the chain of the sin of divorce being passed down from the father to the children, just as the scripture says. Now, if you're divorced, I'm not trying to beat you up today, folks, because I'm not trying to beat myself up. I'm not trying to make you feel condemned, because the truth is, if you've been divorced, all sin is forgiven in Christ. All sin is renewed. But what I am trying to say is that we need to understand that raising children who follow God faithfully, closely, eagerly, continually is our number one priority as parents, bar none. Bar none. The number one priority as parents and as grandparents is to have godly children. Nothing else is more important. How do we do it? God gives us an example in Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourself to husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not treat them harsh. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. In this thing, there are four messages or four things that we understand. We begin to understand that we are to teach our children by example. Again, what does it say? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Children, if we know, are sponges. They suck up everything, man. The younger they are, the more they are. My friend, we're back in seminary, and we were all assigned field work places. In other words, you were, you were assigned a church that the second year of seminary you would go to, and you'd help out and do little things around whatever they asked you to do. And my friend, who had six kids, was late that day, and he was breaking the speed limit by quite a bit when the cops pulled him over. And uh, he's sitting on the side of the road on his way to church late, and he 
cops is looking and talks to him. He looks in and says, well, at least I see all you got your kids all buckled up. And the littlest one pops up and says, oh, daddy makes us always buckle in when he's going to speed to church. <laughs> Truth. He got a ticket, too. <laughs> Children pick up everything. Everything. The way you talk, how you treat your spouse, your attitude towards work, you name it, kids pick it up. And so that is what Paul is telling us. Today, Paul's telling them, if your kids are going to pick it up, have them pick up the Word. Have them pick up the Word of God. How? Let them see you studying the Word of God. I've talked about that many times. My, one of my greatest pictures of my dad is the fact that every night at 11 o'clock, he would go in and do his portals of prayer and read his scripture every night, no matter what. I remember that. Refer to the Word of God regularly in your conversations with them. Talk to them about the Word of God. How many times have you talked to your kids about the Word of God? Admonish them with wisdom, not anger. It's easy to get angry. Admonish them with the wisdom of God. Sing hymns and praise songs. If you can't sing a hymn, hum. If you can't hum, whistle. If you can't whistle, just kind of go, or whatever you can do. Let them hear the praise of God come out of your mouth. Listen, if you don't know any, go turn to Joy FM. You'll learn them. Or KFUO, either one. You'll learn different songs there, but you'll, you'll learn them. Live an attitude of thanks to God today. Our kids see that. Are they picking up that every day we're thankful for God, for his love and his mercy and his forgiveness? Discuss with them daily the importance of their faith. Talk to them about it, how God set them apart for themselves, how God has blessed them with his love, with his eternal life, and with joy. Talk to them, no matter what age they are. Talk to them about God. Show them by your example. Let them catch what God has given you. Second, we teach our children by our obedience. Wives, submit to your husband as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, we all joke about saying to our kids, do as I say, but not as I do, right? But we all know better than that. Kids never do what we say. They do what we do. That's a reality. So how... Can you rightfully expect your children to be obedient to God when you're not? If you're not striving to live Christ in your life every day, why do you expect your kids to do it? When you don't bring them to church regularly, do you honestly think they will go to church on their own later in life? When we strive for worldly things and we're constantly consumed with what is, fits our pleasures and what we want, television, movies, fishing, hunting, whatever it is, vacations, do you really think if that's what they see when they grow up that they're going to put God first in their life? Again, one more quote from C.F. Walter. Again, he nails it. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever have the guts to say some of this stuff. Instead of lighting the way, he's talking about parents, instead of lighting the way for their children through their God-pleasing example, through their zeal and seriousness in their Christianity, they seduce them to a similarly ungodly way of life through their bad examples, through their lukewarm, sluggish Christianity. Oh, you unfortunate people who act like that. If you considered what you are doing, and if you would hear the woe that God calls down upon such conscienceless parents, you'd be horrified. For God says in his word, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be yours as well. But you do the opposite and seek first the kingdom of this world. God further says in his world, for what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give for an exchange for his soul? But you consider the souls of your children a thousand times less 
important than this whole world. Yes, what shall I say? You sell your children body and soul to the servants of the devil so that they can gain a few rusty dollars. Now, that's about as blunt as you can put it, folks. Reality is God has created us to train our children. So wives, if we're going to talk about obedience, then wives submit to your husbands as it's fitting to the Lord. What example have you set? Teaching our children. And husbands, the Bible tells you to love your wives and do not be harsh to them. Do your children see that on a daily basis in your life? Do you love and lay down your wife, your life for your wife just as Christ did? Children, the Bible tells you to obey your parents in everything, for this is what pleases the Lord. Are we obeying God by obeying our parents? Those are questions we've got to ask. Moses' last words, book of Deuteronomy, last words speech, basically, he gives to Deuteronomy before he dies, before he gives the people of Israel. He writes this. Sorry, guys. Just go like that if I need to go up one more screen. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey him, and remain faithful to him, for he is your life, and he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice what he's telling them. God has set before us, before our families, blessings and curses. What do you choose? Choose life. Choose life faithfulness to God. Choose obedience. We may know the blessings of God not only in our lives, but on the generations to follow us. God blesses our obedience. Let's teach that to our children. A third thing tells us to do is that we are to teach our children with discipline. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I still like the King James Version. That was bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But the word is actually training in Greek. Okay? It literally means to tutor. That is education or training by implication, disciplinary correction, chastising, chastisement, and structure, and nurture. That's what the word means. Okay, so in other words, what God's telling us is we are to discipline our children. Now, in my generation, since the time I was little, we've gone from you could be spanked in school to now you can't spank in school. Now your parents can't spank. We've gone from literally discipline to no discipline in one generation. And I'll tell you what, I would hate to be a teacher right now because I don't know how you discipline your kids in school. In fact, there's an article on the Daily Wire. I didn't print it out. I'm sorry, but I should have. In the title of it is, let me, let me get the title directly to you. I love this. Okay. Parents who discipline their children, parentheses, especially traditional and religious parents, are an oppressive class. So you folks who discipline, you're oppressive. In the article, it says that parents who ground their children, who literally, they say, force them to stay in the house against their will, are oppressing their children and denying their freedom. If you take their phone away from them, you are denying them social contact. It's the truth, guys. I'm just telling you what it says. We've gone from discipline to no discipline. And yet the scripture is very clear that we are to discipline our children in love. Not in anger, not in vengeance, but we are to welcome and submit to God's discipline to us. Okay? In the book of Hebrews, we read this. Did I get the right button? There we go. As you have forgot, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as his sons? 
My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, catch this, if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate son, children, and not sons. If we refuse the discipline of God, if we do not receive the discipline of God, and we're not take the discipline of God, we are literally illegitimate children and not sons. So if the scripture tells us that we're not God's children, if we do not re-discipline, receive God's discipline, what does it say about our discipline? And how we treat our children when we don't discipline them. And I'm not going to go in if it's proper discipline or improper discipline or whatever. You can go into that your whole whole time. People can argue that all over the place. But the reality is we are to discipline our children to train them into God. That's the command of God. Number four, we teach our children in love. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. In all our actions, there's to be love. In our example, there should be love. In our obedience to God, there should be love. In our discipline to our children, it should be out of love. In every area, there's to be love. Not anger, not frustration, not vengeance, love. Why? Because it's the Father's love that we've been given. It's the Father's love that draws us close to God. It's the Father's love that disciplines us. It's the Father's, because of the Father's love, that he sacrificed his own son for us. It's all about love. I love that song, uh, that, that song by Holly Dunn, Daddy's Hands. Remember that one? You know? I love the chorus. Daddy's hands were soft and kind when I was crying. Daddy's hands were as hard as steel when I'd done wrong. Daddy's hands weren't always gentle, but I've come to understand there was always love in Daddy's hands. How true that is of God's hands for us. No matter whether we feel his hands are hard or whether there's love and compassion, everything, there's always love in God's hands for you. So God, your Father, deals with you in love. Everything that God does for you is in love from his hand. As God's children, as followers of Christ, you will never experience the wrath of God. Understand that. You may think you do, but you don't. You don't want to. Better to be thrown in the, in the ocean with a millstone. You will never experience the anger of God. You will never experience the frustration of God. That is all paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Only the love of God. So all you and I will ever experience, only the love of God. Everything God does in our lives is for our best. That's God's promise. That's God's heart. Shouldn't it be for our children? When we raise our children in his way, the only thing they will ever experience from us is love. And their lives will be a reflection of that love throughout their lives. Amen. And now may a peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from this day forward to life everlasting. Amen.